Okay, well, I believe that it's one o'clock. Are y'all ready to begin? Yes, ma'am. All right, well, welcome everyone. I would like to thank everyone for attending um, Transition um, for Early Steps. Um, I appreciate everyone taking the time out of their busy day and their busy schedule to um, take their take time to come in and sit in on this webinar with us. Um, just to let y'all know, um, my portion um, that I will be going through will not be very long. I will um, go through my portion. It will take me maybe about 15 or 20 minutes. And then we will transition to uh, Ms. Melinda Elliott. I will be introducing her once my um, portion is done. Um, we do um, have a chat box. If you have any questions, you can place your questions in the chat box. Um, and just to let y'all know um, that we are recording um this webinar so without without further ado we will go ahead and get started <clears throat> um so um with the slides um the very first slide that we're gonna go over it just kind of goes over um the chain of command with early steps we have the regional coordinator which as of right now, that position is actually vacant in Region 5. Um, the Community Outreach Specialist, that is myself. The Families Helping Families Region uh, Executive Director is Ms. Susan Rehm. Um, The Children's Special Health Service Parent Liaison um, is Davlin Patrick. We always say that Children's Special Health Children's Special Health Services is like a sister service to early steps. Um, so um, we do a lot of referring to that particular agency. Um, so um, if you have any questions on Children's Special Health Services, please um, ask those questions in the chat box and we'll be happy to answer those. So what is Early Steps? Early Steps is um, an early intervention services service that provides community-based services to children with disabilities and developmental delays from age um, birth to three and their family members. The supports are used as family educates and training program to provide resources through those critical years. Um, <clears throat> What I try to tell a lot of my families is that um, early steps is a training tool. That's what um, our program is based on. It's, it's based on a training model. So we go into the home, we provide early intervention services, but we're actually going in to train the parents so that they can continue those services once the provider is gone. So yes, um, you may get um, 30 minutes of services uh, twice a month, or you may get an hour of services twice a month. So what we do is we go in for those two hours twice a month, and we show those different skills, or we show different techniques, and the mom and the provider talk about things that, that works and things that don't work. And um, we come up with different techniques for the parents to try once the providers are gone so that the parents can continue those training models so that the, uh, the babies can get the best care possible, okay? Um, so um, transition regulations is actually based from part C of the Individual Disability Act from IDEA. Um, 
<clears throat> it requires that certain steps be taken when when your child transition out of part c which is early steps at age three the transition process begins at the initial um ifsp which is your individual service plan so they're really supposed to be talking about transition at every meeting so the very first time that they go in for intake, the very first time that they meet the parents, they're supposed to talk about transition. When they go in and they talk about the IFSP, they're supposed to be talking about transition. When they go in for a quarterly meeting, they're supposed to be talking about transition. When it's, when it's a, um, an evaluation, um, an every year evaluation, they're supposed to be talking about transition. So that is supposed to be an ongoing process. Okay, so IDEA Part B states that by the child's third birthday, that an IEP should be developed and implemented. So what that means is when your child turns three years old at 12.01 a.m., they have transitioned from early steps, which is an IFSP, to um, Part B, which is the school system, which is an IEP, okay? So transition plan includes steps and activities necessary to prepare the parents for upcoming transition from early steps. So IDEA requires that planning for transition begins no less than 90 days before the child turns three. Early steps requires that transition meets the schedules when the child is between 27 and 33 months of age, or as soon as possible for newly enrolled children at age two. Um, the transition plan is discussed at all IFSP meetings include the initial, the six months, the review, the annual. So that's what I was saying um, previously. So every meeting that you have, you are supposed to be talking about transition. It is an ongoing process. So um, your FSC, which is your family support coordinator, um, they are supposed to invite the school system and other representatives to attend um, and provide information to the parents. They send the team meeting notifications prior to, um, prior to the meetings, at least 10 days in advance. They notify the LEA, which is the school system, um, when the child is turning three at two years old, two months, through two years old, nine months. They are also supposed to ensure that all proper documentation is sent to the Human District Authority, which is MCAL in the Calcasieu Parish area. Um, at, um, by age two years old and nine months. Um, that part is very, very important. There is another slide that we're going to uh, get to that's going to talk about MCAL and because um, that is a very important piece. Um, so facilit um, facilitate the meetings and make sure that all documentations are signed and, um, and everything is discussed at all of the meetings. Okay. So the purpose of the meeting is to discuss and develop upcoming um, transition plans. So the things that y'all are supposed to be discussing at this meeting is to review your child's option for when your child turns three um, through the remainder of the school year. Secondly, you're also, also supposed to be talking about transition plans that includes the steps to exit from part C, um, develop at a transition conference, which is that transition meeting that we spoke about prior um, where the LEA is invited. Any transition services um, that the IFSP team identifies as needed by the child and the family. 
and four. Um, if the child is entering the school system, the discussion will include moving from an IFSP to an IEP. Okay. So some of the options that should be discussed upon exiting part C, um, there are several options. So you can talk about whether or not you want to go into the school system. Some parents feel as though uh, that their child is not ready for school, which is okay. And um, so if you are one of those parents that feel as though you don't think that your child is ready for school, that's okay. Um, there's pediatric daycare, there's homeschooling, there's preschool, there's Head Start, there's daycare, there's Mother's Day out. So those are some of the things that your FSC can talk to you about if you're not ready to do that transition into the, um, into the school system. Um, your responsibility as a family member, um, you are to attend a transition meeting, you are to sign the consent for your child's information for the Human Service District Authority, which is MCAL, um, and call the Human Service Authority District in your area as soon as transition meetings is scheduled for an entry appointment. This is what I was talking about when I said that we were gonna to get to that part that was very important. Okay, so what they're talking about is they will have paperwork that your FSC will talk to you about and say, hey, we have documentation because um, he's getting ready to transition from early steps. Um, and so now we, we need to talk about some community-based services. Are you interested in MCAL? At that point in time, um, you're gonna sign those documentation saying, yes, I'm interested in MCAL. I'm interested in getting those services. You have until um, from age three until age five to make sure that all of your documentation is signed and everything, all your ducks is in a row, which I tell a lot of my parents do not wait until age five because nine times out of ten you will forget about those things so once it's fresh on your mind when you're talking about it go ahead and take the initiative to um to call and say um hey mcal i'd like to go ahead and set up my entry appointment can um can i come in and get all of my documentation signed what all do I need? What all do I need to bring in there so that um, I can get my baby's uh, sunscreening done because that's what's needed, okay? Um, that is very, very important. Um, I know prior we used to have what they call the, um, the waiver waiting list. Um, and I used to tell a lot of my parents that list was like 14 years long, which now they're, they're doing the sun screening, which, which uh, kind of helps eliminate it, the wait for that 14 year uh, waiting list in some instances. So it is best to go ahead and get those documentation signed and get in as quick as possible and have um, your evaluation done, your screening done, to have all your documentations turned in, have all your paperwork signed and get everything done that you need done with MCAL, okay? Okay, so um, the next thing is attend the evaluation by um, LEA for eligibility. Remember, LEA is with the school system. Attend your, um, your entry appointment with your local um, Human Services Authority District, which is MCAL, which is what we just talked about. Um, keep contact information current with the school system and with MCAL. Okay, so the school's responsibility, um, LEA. Attending um, the early steps transition meeting, conducting the evaluation of a child to make sure that they are um, meet the, the required eligibility for part B, which is the school system service, and sign the consent release um, for the parent. 
If your child is determined eligible for LEA, which is the school system, develop and implement the individual plan, which is your IEP by the child's third birthday. Okay, so once this is done, when you are starting um, to go in and they do the evaluation um, for the school system, we tell every parent, um, once your child turns three years old and they are transitioning from early substance to the school, they will be starting with that IEP. So once you're going through the evaluation process with the school and you're not, you're, you're at the point to where you feel as though you don't agree with that evaluation, we tell a lot of our parents, um, if you do not sign that very first evaluation, then um, you will not receive an IEP in school. So that will not start at your third birthday. So if you want your child to have that IEP um, at their third birthday, once they transition from early steps, then you have to sign the IEP at age three. Okay, so I just wanted y'all to know that, that that IEP needs to be signed in order for y'all to transition from the IFSP to the IEP. Okay, okay, so this um, graph right here shows you the difference between part C, which is early steps, to part um, B, which is the school system. Um, so part B, family involvement, um, early steps is family centered, the school system is child centered. I will, be the, I will be the very first person to tell you that in early steps, we coddle our parents. We do, we do. Because we are based around family. Our motto is um, a family centered model. We go in, we want to know what the parents want. We want to know about your daily routines. We want to know what's going on in the household. We want to know how we can help, what areas we can look at. So we, we do. It is, it is very family-centered. Whenever you get into the school system, it will not be that way. It is child-centered, so they only looking at what they feel as though the child needs, not as what the, not what's based around your home environment or um, any um, uh, home activities or anything like that. So that is the difference between um, family-centered and child-centered. Okay, um, the types of plan. We have an IFSP um, in early steps in school. It is an IEP. Um, as far as services, we look at developmental delays and in school it is um, educational based. Um, service delivery, we provide those service in a natural environment, which could be at home, in a daycare, at a grandparent's home, um, anywhere that's considered to be a natural environment. Not a clinical setting for early steps, but a natural environment. So if you want to meet at the park and have your services done at a park, we can do that. Um, if you feel as though um, y'all at McDonald's and your child enjoy um, the jungle gym at McDonald's and y'all want to have um, one of your services provided at McDonald's, we can do that because that is considered a natural environment. That's a natural setting. That's somewhere that your child goes as an everyday routine. Whereas school, um, part B, it is only in a school setting, okay? Um, the human service, of district, human service District Authority, that is MCAL. Um, waiver registry pay, paperwork from early steps is received at age two years old, two months. 
um, you may receive a phone call or a letter from MCAL um, after your early steps transition um, to schedule an entry appointment. They may call and the reason that I'm saying that is because there is a lot going on. There is. So if you do not get a call, do not hesitate to call them and say, hey, I'm supposed to get a call from MCAL. I did not receive a call. Call them. You're definitely welcome to call them at any time um, and say, hey, um, I, I need to schedule an appointment. Um, my child is um, transitioning from early steps or my child has already transitioned from early steps. And I wanna confirm um, where we are in the process. That is your right to do that. Don't be afraid to make those calls, okay? If a child exits early steps before the age, before the age three, does not have an active IFP for any reason, the LEA, the school system, is not obligated to have an, evalu um, an evaluation and IEP in place at the child's third birthday. So let's say that your child has met all of their goals at the age two and they exit out. So at three years old, they're not in early steps. So in that instance, then it becomes the parent's responsibility to follow through and make sure that that process is done with the school system. So if you want your child to be evaluated for services, um, then you have to be able to contact the school in writing, send a request and say, hey, I would like my child to be evaluated um, for services. So that would be your responsibility to make sure that, that that gets done. It will also be your responsibility to contact MCAL and say, hey, my child turns three um, we're, we were no longer in early steps. He aged out, but he's three years old now. Um, and I would like to make sure that um, all of my documentation um, is in, what documentation I need to turn in. Is my address current? Is my contact information current? Um, is there anything else that you need from me? That's your responsibility to make sure that all of those ducks are in a row and that all of your um, T's are crossed and your I's are dotted. So that concludes my portion of um, transition for early steps. And so um, I'm not sure if y'all had any questions for me at this time. Did y'all happen to have any questions for me? Doesn't look like there's any questions in the chat box, China. Okay. Okay, well, without further ado, um, I would like to thank everybody this afternoon um, for attending again, and I am pleased to welcome Miss Melinda Elliott. Um, she is a very special guest from Lake Charles. Miss Melinda also works with family, uh, Families Help and Family. She is an education support specialist, and today she will be sharing information with us um, and her experts on transitioning at age three. Um, just to let y'all know that all the lines are muted. So please uh, make sure that your questions um, are added in the chat box and um, hold your questions until the end, if possible. Um, and we will have a, um, a survey that will go out and we ask that y'all please um, get the survey done if at all possible. So with all that said, um, I ask that y'all give y'all full attention to Miss Melinda Elliott. Thank you, Miss Melinda. 
Thank you, Chun. So let me start my screen share so y'all can see my PowerPoint. As y'all can see, y'all can't see me on, um, oops, went too far. Y'all can't see me on the screen because I don't wanna be looking at myself and be worried about the, um, my hair or my lipstick. Um, there we are. Um, I have five children. They're all grown now. Um, and they, um, some of them had disabilities, some didn't. I have eight grandchildren now. And again, some of them have disabilities and some of them don't. Um, and they're all under 18. So hopefully there isn't going to be any great grands for a little while yet. Um, I'm basically going to talk about the um, IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. Um, this um, starts falling into place at three years old. Um, the purpose of the law is to ensure that um, children get FAPE which is designed, FAPE stands for Free Appropriate Public Education, which is designed to um, meet the unique needs of children with disabilities. Um, and it's supposed to, call, uh, and calls for a statewide, comprehensive, coordinated, multidisciplinary interagency system of early intervention services for infants and toddlers. Um, it, Begin, uh, this particular part of the law begins at age three through 21. So beginning no later than their third birthday, um, there are special education and related services that are at public expense and supervision. Um, so it shouldn't cost the parents anything. It should meet the standards of the Louisiana Department of Education. It should include preschool, elementary, and secondary education and is provided in conformity with the IEP. Um, FAPE also applies to suspended or expelled children. Um, so they get um, services even if they're in uh, being suspended or expelled given certain parameters. Um, so the federal law set up a um, group of children, three to nine years old, um, a few years ago that um, they call developmental delay. Um, that particular classification of children was set up because the states had gone to the federal legislature and said, you know, they're so little and they're so young that um, sometimes it's hard to give them one of the um, more definitive classifications like other health impairment or autism. Um, and um, we need something in between. Not that three to nine year olds can't have those classifications, but developmental delay gives them, uh, the school systems, the ability to say, we know there's something here, and if we can get enough help and services in here, we can um, uh, do something about it. And maybe they won't need services, because that's the ideal, is that they wouldn't need special education services. Um, but we need something to call that group so that um, we can get them what they're what they need. Um, special education is specially designed instruction at no cost to meet the kid, uh, children's unique needs. Um, it can be in the classroom, it can be the home, the hospital, an institution. As you know, these days, it can be virtual as well. Um, special education also includes um, physical education. Um, related services are about transportation um, and developmental or corrective or support services as required to assist the child to benefit from special education. So any one of these things is related services from social work to psychological to speech any of those things. Um, if they need medical services for the evaluations purposes. Um, for an initial evaluation, a parent's consent is required for an initial evaluation. 
um, just because mom or dad consents to an initial evaluation doesn't mean that they're consenting for the actual services. That's why you come back after, or sometimes in the same meeting, you're having an evaluation, dissemination, and you're also having an IEP meeting, but sometimes they're separate meetings. And um, you're consenting, you're signing again for services. Um, there are some parents that get the evaluation and say, oh no, oh, no I need to think about this. Um, and they're not ready to do an IEP. Um, and there's parents that are ready to put together an IEP right away and start getting things into place. Um, if the parent refuses a initial evaluation, the school is under no obligation to provide services and there's no what we call protections. Um, protections are the school knew or should have known that they had a disability. Um, the school systems can't override, uh, override um, the um, parents consent for the initial evaluation. Um, on the other hand, if it's a re-evaluation and the school can't get a hold of the parents for some reason, um, they can that you're supposed to document what they did and be able to um, go ahead and continue the evaluation and continue services for the child. Um, it, it, it's a little bit different in this um, uh, uh, situation um, where for whatever reasons they can't get a hold of the parent. Um, so an initial evaluation does a couple of things. It decides if a child is a child with a disability and it decides if educational need. Now you can see on my screen where it says that um, it's supposed to be completed within 60 days with the things going on with the coronavirus. Bessie come back and uh, was uh, uh, interested in providing some um, flexibility to the school systems. And that has actually um, increased to 90 days um, so that the school system has a little bit of extra time to figure out what and how they're gonna do. Um, parents, teachers, um, educa other educators in the school system make the request for the evaluation, but it's the parent that gives the consent um, for the initial evaluation that they call it informed consent. Um, the schools tell the parent the tools that they're going to use, the strategies going to use, and to decide if the child has a disability under IDEA. So it isn't just any disability. It's a specific, uh, 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 there's a handbook um, where, with specific disabilities under IDEA, specific things for those disabilities. And the school system uses those tools and strategies to determine the contents of the IEP, but they can't use just one instrument to be able to do it. They're supposed to be using non-discriminatory um, evaluation materials using it in the child's native language or mode of communication. The purposes for which the assessment is valid and reliable and given by parent, uh, staff who are trained and knowledgeable um, according to the instructions. Um, don't just look at IQ. They're supposed to look at a range of things and that is accurate in showing the child's aptitude and achievement, not just impairment. So um, we want to know what they're good at, not just what they're bad at, or what their potential is, not just what they're having issues with. Um, you parents should get the evaluation in writing and keep a copy of the request for the evaluation. Sometimes parents come to me and um, maybe a counselor, a provider has made a, a request, getting a copy of that as well. Um, I'm going to talk just a second at the end about keeping records. Um, but um, uh, you want copies of those things. Um, you want to explain, um, if you write 
a request, your child's problems and why you think the evaluation is needed. Um, you also, in that request, as well as during the evaluation, want to share important information with the school staff about the child's performance and your concerns. Um, there's a place on the IEP that's called parental concerns. Um, uh, I don't know any parent that doesn't have concerns for their kids. Um, you will sign giving informed consent that you understand what's going on and that you agree to what go is going on um, for the evaluation. Um, if you get to the point where you need an individual independent educational evaluation, that means you're not agreeing with the evaluation from the school system and you probably need to have a conversation or two or three with um, our educational specialists if you're at that point that you're requesting an independent educational evaluation. But if you don't agree, there's things, there's steps that you can take to um, get somebody different to have a look at what's going on. Um, it's at public, that independent ed educational evaluation is at public expense. Um, you have to go through certain steps. Um, if the parents request an independent evalu educational evaluation, the agency has to initiate a hearing to show that its evaluation is appropriate or pay for the independent educational evaluation. But like I said, there are steps that you probably need to have a consultation with one of us. Um, about. If the public education agency, if the local education agency shows that a hearing its evaluation is appropriate, parents can always get an independent educational evaluation. Um, there's a structure for that. It has to be a certain type of evaluation um, and pay for it themselves. And some parents to choose to do that from the beginning. Um, so when you're writing an IEP, um, a lot of times um, parents will tell me that um, they don't understand the parts of the IEP. That's where your evaluation comes into play, um, especially for three-year-olds. Um, one of my favorite phrases to remind parents that they can use is to ask, okay, where is the data? Where is the stuff from the evaluation that means that this is a good goal or objective for my child? Where does it show us that they're at this point and that we're headed to um, this is the next step or this is the next um, point that we want to go to? Um, specifically about those um, three-year-olds, um, children in early intervention programs are supposed to experience a smooth and effective transition to preschool programs. Nothing breaks my heart more than to find a mother and their child is three and a half or three and 10 months and um, they never got in, they had early step services but didn't get into school system services and they don't know why. Um, it's, not, uh, it, it's possible that their child didn't qualify, but they don't even know that. Um, so in, in reality, everybody, it's written into the law and everybody is work, working to make sure there's a smooth and effective transition. By the third birthday, like China said, you know, three, 1201 on their third, uh, 1201 AM? Yeah, AM. On their third birthday, there's an IEP or an IFSP in effect. So what that means is that the school system could have written an IEP. I have also seen where the school system has taken the IFSP, put their cover letter on the top, and used the IFSP. Some parents are quite pleased with the home services that they've been getting at zero to three and are quite interested. They're just not ready for their child to go to school at three, whether it's Head Start, whether it's preschool, whether it's daycare. Um, and the IFSP is, um, uh, 
it is a perfectly valid document with the school systems cover um, letter on the top to be able to continue those services. Most of the time, the school system takes the IFSP and whatever they found out during their evaluation process and develop their own IEP though. I just want y'all to be prepared if you see an IFSP with a cover letter on it from the school system that that's valid as well. Um, the LEA can participate in transition and should participate in transition planning conferences with the lead agency. Um, sometimes they have a meeting with the parent um, uh, on their own and sometimes they come to the same ma meeting with the um, family service coordinator. Um, but the LEA is an important member of that transition planning process too. Um, so usually you see the IFSP, the Individual Family Service Plan for children birth through second year. So two years and um, almost three years, um, you'll see that IFSP. Um, it's family center, China told you these things, multi-agency coordinated, that zero, uh, three to five pa uh, years old is state of policy, parent agrees, they can use the individual family service plan. Um, let's see. So who's going to be on the IEP team? Because you go from uh, the types of meeting that you have in early steps to an IEP team. And there's some very, um, in the law, uh, re uh, regulated, named members roles on the team, the parents, the um, regular education teacher. So that might be a Head Start teacher for the little ones, that might be a preschool teacher, that might be some, uh, the, the teacher at the daycare, a special education teacher, whether that's a teacher that comes to your house, whether that's a teacher that goes to the daycare, whether that's the special education teacher, at the schoolhouse um, and the LEA representative. In our state, we call those the ODR, the officially designated representative. And ODR is a person that knows about the curriculum and the resources in that school system and can say, we can do these things. Somebody who can interpret evaluation results. A lot of times that could be a teacher, a principal, a counselor, um, or it can be somebody from pupil appraisal, the people that did the evaluation. Others with knowledge or expertise, so, uh, sometimes that's how parents bring me, parents bring um, providers that help them with their child. Um, uh, somebody say from the autism team, somebody uh, from, uh, from a school system. Um, uh, there's probably a variety of people that I'm not thinking of right this second. And then the child when appropriate. Um, children learn to be their own advocates by seeing um, mom, uh, people in the school system advocating and um, negotiating. Um, so it's entirely appropriate for your child to be able to attend those meetings. Um, you don't have to wait for a certain age. Um, let's see. So the regular education teacher and maybe uh, my, generally I see this for the regular education teacher. Um, they're not their attendance isn't necessary, especially if they're, it's hard to imagine with the little ones, but in the older students, when their area is not being modified or discussed. So um, maybe we're not having problems in math and we don't need the math teacher to be there. Um, you will give your consent in writing when you sign that IEP. Um, they still should submit input in writing. There's a form that they use, um, particularly in Calcasieu Parish, where they talk about the grade in that class and they talk about um, uh, uh, 
what they have noticed or where they're going or sometimes what's missing in the coursework. Um, again, for those little ones, if the parent requests the Part C coordinator or um, other early steps um, representatives can be invited to the initial IEP meeting for a child that's going from um, early steps to the school system. Um, the IEP has several pieces. Um, the present levels, they call it the plat, plat, plop. Um, different school systems call it different things. Present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. This talks about how the disability affects involvement and progress in the general curriculum. Um, for school age children, it's more, it, it, it looks more like what would they be doing compared to what other kids are doing at that age. Um, then measurable annual goals, including academic and functional goals. So um, say potty training. Potty training um, for um, a student might be entirely appropriate to be on their IEP. Um, and I've seen it on many IEPs um, because that's what they're doing at that age. Um, you know, making marks on paper. They're not writing their name um, at you know, three and four years old, maybe they're making marks on paper, or maybe they're making swirly marks or straight marks. Um, so you, those are sort of goals that um, you might have to meet the child's, uh, so the child can make progress in the um, general curriculum, can make progress and things that they're doing. Um, there might be other educational needs as a result uh, from disability. So maybe there's things about behavior or maybe there's, um, you know, uh, speech therapy, occupational therapy. The other thing that you should see on the IEP is how progress will be measured and when you'll get reports of progress. So um, you should at the very least get what's called a progress report every time you get a report card. And a report card is not the same thing as a progress report. Um, I bump into that situation all the time where they'll say, well, we got this um, uh, document from the um, teacher. Um, that's not the same thing as a progress report. Um, progress reports um, for special education. We'll talk about the IEP. Um, special education related services. So these things are other supports and services that help you advance to your goal, advance in the general education curriculum, maybe participate in extracurricular activities, uh, be educated and participate with other children. Um, the IEP is also going to talk about if it's happening, um, why students aren't participating with non-disabled peers and where that's happening, when that's happening. Um, because IEPs are designed for students to be with typical students. Um, so these are some of the questions you might answer. I'm not going to, uh, I might ask, I'm not going to answer these. These are questions for you to think about. Um, you think, uh, so when you're looking at your child's IEP, you want to think about, are the goals measurable? Will I know when it happens? Um, will they are, be able to do X by X point? Is my child in regular education all or part of the day? Why or why not? What are the modifications and supports and accommodations, um, including those for testing later in um, their school career. Is the school expecting the kind of progress, kind of progress I believe my child should make? Um, sometimes the school will say, well, they only make three months progress in the year. Well, then that means they're steadily getting farther and farther behind. Um, is that what I believe my child should be able to do um, or not? Um, is my child expected and able to meet graduation requirements? 
Again, that's probably going to come a little bit farther down the road than three years old, but it's still something to remember. And when, when are we going to do the IEP again? And if you need help with any of these um, questions or need to talk about any of these questions, you're welcome to call our um, education specialists um, or you can ask me in the chat. Um, least restrictive environment. Um, least restrictive environment is um, something that's talked about specifically in the law to the maximum extent appropriate children with disabilities, including children in public or private institutions or other care facilities are educated with children who are not disabled. Um, it's actually a continuum of placements um, and that uh, some children may be moving around in. It might be regular classroom, it might be special classroom, it might be special classroom some of the time, and regular classroom some of the time. Um, it might be that we temporarily have to do um, special classrooms for whatever reasons, and then eventually move back to um, regular classrooms, special classrooms to regular classrooms. Um, it might be self-contained classrooms at times for some kids. Um, and we're looking back to move back. Um, it changes, um, but it's decided by parents and other people on the IEP team. Um, it's determined annually based on the IEP. Um, the school should be at the, um, uh, the, the kids should be at the school as close to home as possible. Ideally, the same school that the neighborhood kids are going to. Um, and the same, essentially the same placement as if they weren't, uh, they didn't have a disability. Um, let's see, and your child shouldn't be in a resource classroom or a self-contained classroom just because they need accommodations or modifications. Uh, you know, a bajillion years ago, I've been doing this 25 years, I think. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I talked to a parent and her child had to be in the special education classroom all day because um, they didn't want to rearrange the desk for her to be able to get her um, wheelchair into the regular classroom. Hopefully that's not, happening anymore, but the fact that she needed some other arrangement for the regular education classroom wasn't reason for her to have to be in the special education classroom. Um, procedural safeguards, I like procedural safeguards. Procedural safeguards tell me what to do if. So, um, you only get these once a year. It's usually in the form of a booklet and maybe a few pages that they give you. Um, so you should get these every IEP meeting, every, once a year at an IEP meeting, not every IEP meeting. You should get these a few other times, that booklet and pieces of paper. So when there's an initial referral, where you're, when you're gonna sign and say, let's do the evaluation. Um, you should get this. Um, if you request an evaluation, you should get a copy of that book. Um, you can't know what to do if you don't get the evaluation if nobody tells you. Well, unless you know one of us and call us, we can tell you. Um, DPHR, due process hearing. Um, if you file due process, hopefully you're already talking to one of us or someone else that knows about due process, and you should get a copy of your procedural safeguards. Um, if you ask them, they'll give you one of those books. Um, sometimes they'll try and give it to you even more than one IEP meeting a year. Um, by law, they have, the school systems have the right to post notices on their websites um, uh, with all this information as well. Um, you know, I, there's always interesting things in there. It tells you about time frames. It tells you about resolution 
um, uh, processes that you might use. Um, it tells you about all kinds of things in the procedural safeguard notice. Um, I, I talked about this for like a half a second earlier. Um, there are protections for children. Um, if you know someone or if you have an older child and they're, uh, they haven't been named, uh, deemed eligible for special education, um, there are protections for that child if the LEA, local education agency, is deemed to have knowledge that the child is a child with a disability. So a lot of times I see this about behavior. Um, and if before the behavior that precipitated suspension, expulsion, whatever, um, that the parent expressed concern in writing to an administrator or teacher. That's why you always keep um, record of um, something, a copy of something that you've sent to the school system, um, you know, expressing your concerns, requesting help. Um, if the parent requested an evaluation, so sometimes things are falling apart fast and the parent is requested an evaluation and the child is continuing to have trouble and get into trouble. When you're in the middle of that evaluation process, um, the school system is supposed to work with you um, before they go to an expulsion. Um, and then if the teacher or um, other school member or somebody else in the local education agency expressed concerns about a pattern of behavior to an administrator. And I just want to say, because I'm almost at the end, but if you notice on my um, slides, Wallace is going to send you a copy of this. If you notice on my slides up in that top right hand corner, you see numbers and parentheses and letters and more numbers. You can actually put those into search and go to the section of law that talks about the things that I use in my PowerPoint. Um, and, and I also had mentioned this, keeping your records. It doesn't have to be something fancy. Some years I was, when my own children were in, special education. Um, I had a binder and it was pretty and it had plastic sleeves and I would put the date on the bottom right hand corner and things were all organized. Some years it was a box, um, but I knew where stuff was. Um, I know some parents that use an accordion file. I know some parents that have a drawer at home, but um, you keep medical stuff in there. You never know when that is going to be important. You keep school records, assessments, whether it's regular ed or special ed, IEPs, discipline reports. Um, we're getting more things the majority of the time than we realize. We get star reports. We get reports from the librarian. We get a variety of reports from the teachers. There's all kinds of assessments. Um, maybe the teacher sent you a note. Maybe the principal sent you a letter. You should keep copies of that. Is something going on that is important that um, you want to keep track of? May, write yourself a note. Um, I kept the notebook. Um, you know, the date, the time, um, if I was speaking to someone who I spoke to, what I spoke to them about, if it was some behavior, uh, reaction to medicine, um, whatever that I was keeping track of, of observations, the time, date, whatever it is. Um, and uh, I, I have a friend that keeps a calendar, and those are kind of things she writes on her calendar. But you want to keep records. You never know when it, those are going to become important. And um, I've mentioned a couple of times about um, things have changed. Um, I have a webinar coming up later this month about um, virtual IEP meetings. Um, I don't want to sound like a commercial, but um, you might want to um, attend that webinar and um, get some ideas about how things can look like for virtual IEP meetings. 
Um, if anybody has any questions, I don't know if I can see the chat from where I am, but um, I'd be glad to answer questions. And my contact information is on this slide and will be on the one that Wallace sends to you. Um, so, um, you know, feel free to call me and or email me. Um, you know, we will answer. Um, see if I can see the chat from here. Wallace, are you still here? Because I don't know that I can see the chat from here. Yes, I'm still here. We are here, Miss Melinda, and we're monitoring the chats. Um, I don't see that we have any questions, um, but I mean, this is the opportunity to ask them if y'all have any. Um, please do so before we go ahead and we close out. So yes, because it bothers me when I get evaluations back and somebody says you didn't do this or I didn't understand this. Y'all ask me, ask me while the getting is good because I want to make sure that I'm clear and I know it's complicated. Um, I have a question, Ms. Melinda. Um, yes, ma'am. In some instances, um, transitioning from early steps to um, the school system, is there, is there a possibility that they can use the IFSP instead of using the IEP? If they do, they have this cover. Um, I call it a cover letter, but it's a cover page that they put over the top and they're essentially saying we're using the IFSP. I've seen them do that on more than, different school systems do that on more than one occasion. Generally, they don't. Generally, they take the last IFSP and things that they have discovered from their evaluation and develop their own IEP. But yes, they can. Okay. So in some cases, they what they do is they just use the the last the, the last IEP and then they use it um, to kind of combine with the current IEP that they have. Yes, ma'am. Okay. IFSP and combine it with this one, or they just put that cover on the top. Okay. Like I said, that doesn't happen often, but I don't want anybody to freak out if they come across it. Yes. It is possible. And the other question that I have is, if a parent turns down the very first IEP, going through the evaluation process and they're, they don't like the way that things are going and they turn down the very first IEP. Um, does that, is, is that saying that they can never get an, another IEP or is that saying that they have to go through the whole process all over again? It depends on how long it's been. So an evaluation is good for three years. So let's say at three years old, and most parents don't turn down the IEP because they just don't like it. They turn down the IEP because they're uncomfortable, because their child is young, because they don't know the choices that they have. Um, but let's say they did the evaluation, went through the whole evaluation process, and then when it came to the IEP, they said, you know, we're not ready for this for whatever reason. Um, that evaluation is good for three years. Any time in those three years, the parent can go back and contact the school system and say, you know, our situation has changed, our child has changed, um, or we're ready. No real change of any kind. We're just ready now. And the, the school system, system can develop an IEP and, um, start providing services. Generally, they want to do another evaluation, but they don't have to. Um, so it's not like, oh, I turned down the IEP, I'm done, I can't get anything, I have to start at square one. Now, 
you don't want to do the evaluation, that's a whole nother ball game, you know? Um, you don't want to accept the evaluation or sign the evaluation, it's a whole nother ba ball game. But the IEP, there's some more flexibility in there because that evaluation is good for longer. If you have an evaluation at say three and you come back at seven and say, okay, we're ready for an IEP now. Yes, you will start at square one because the evaluation is no longer what they consider good because the three year mark has passed. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, with that being said, I still do not see any question, any other questions in the comment section. So I guess that we're going to go ahead and end it here. I want to thank everyone that took time out of their busy schedule to um, come and share their hour with us. We do appreciate it. Um, and we will be sending out the surveys. Thank y'all so much. Have a good afternoon. Bye.